Greetings and welcome to our program on training the next generation of case management. We're pleased to be speaking to you all as part of this year's virtual annual NACM conference. We recorded this program last week, but you will have the ability to post live questions for us throughout today's program that we will respond to uh, when this program first airs. Uh, you can also send us questions on the feature uh, below and our contact information will be available at the end in case you're watching this later. So uh, my name is Jared Perlow. I am the Chief Deputy Clerk here at the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. And I'm Ken Shane. I've been with the Federal Judiciary for eight years, and now I'm the Operations Manager at the Federal Circuit. And a little bit about the Federal Circuit, in case you're not familiar with us, we're one of 13 intermediate appellate courts in the Federal Judiciary. We are unique, though, among uh, those courts in that uh, we have nationwide subject matter jurisdiction over a variety of areas, whereas the other circuits, the numbered circuits, have uh, geographic and regionally based jurisdiction. But our court hears uh, civil and administrative agency appeals, primarily in the areas of patent litigation, international trade disputes, claims against the federal government, veterans benefits, and federal personnel matters. Our courthouse, which is pictured on the screen, is located in Washington, D.C. We're both coming to you from Washington, D.C. Uh, and um, that picture is taken from Lafayette Park. And those of you who are familiar with the area uh, know that our next door neighbor is the White House. Uh, here at the Federal Circuit, we are uh, have a smaller staff. Um, in the almost four years Ken and I have been with the court, uh, we've looked for new and innovative ways to provide high quality service. Uh, to our stakeholders um, while having a rather small office and operating as efficiently as possible. Today, we're going to talk about just one of those initiatives. So our program is part B of a two-part series on the NACM core competency on educational development. Earlier today, part A of this series aired and introduced the competency to you. We won't repeat that information, but we are highlighting on your screen the six factors from the competency to keep in mind when developing educational and training programs. As you will see shortly, our program touches on many of these factors. We are listing on the screen also the full uh, objectives we have for our program today. Uh, just to go through them quickly though, uh, we're gonna give an overview of current workforce challenges and their impact on training. We're going to discuss the benefits of two different training program concepts. We're going to apply these concepts to training in the court in the area of case management. We're going to discuss necessary resources to support training. And then we're going to talk about quality assurance techniques that can support a successful training program. But before setting out to tackle a problem, we think it's important to understand both challenges you're facing and what is really not working as, as it should. I'm going to share some statistics for you. Uh, they're based on uh, information within the federal government's workforce, but I'm sure these are very similar to what you're seeing across the country. So first, we're seeing a significant generational shift in the workforce so that by 2024, almost half of the workforce will be a newer generation with different career approaches and interests and who grew up immersed in technology. As part of the changing generation, new employees are no longer interested in staying with an organization or in a position for their entire careers. And so we have an ongoing attrition concern uh, with statistically two thirds of entry level employees are predicted to leave within the first three years, which means that as employers, we need to focus on getting them ready to work and to contribute fully to the mission of the courts as quickly as possible. And last, uh, the more experienced workers, namely the baby boomer generation, have either already left or will soon leave the workforce, which means a significant loss of valuable institutional knowledge. Our challenge is then, how can we capture this information and quickly compensate for the inexperience of our newer staff members? When Ken and I joined the federal circuit, we encountered similar challenges, particularly within our case management section, which is responsible for the bulk of the mission accomplishing work of the office. I'm going to turn it over to Ken now to talk about our specific challenges. Thanks, Jarrett. So before we could plan our new way, we identified all the major challenges facing our case management program. 
First, when we arrived at the court, we were told that it takes 12 to 16 months to train a new case manager, which is obviously way too long, especially considering entry-level positions generally stay two to three years. We also had a lack of standardization. We had five case managers who process cases in five different ways. And this is not the consistent level of service that we should be providing our stakeholders. So our training also relied on external factors or factors that were beyond our control. For instance, uh, because we were using on the job training, if we wanna train on a particular case, we needed to wait for that case to be filed in our court. This also gives us a lack of flexibility. We need to drop everything that we're doing when, when one of these kind of more rare cases shows up and then we have to restart our training. We also didn't have any training materials for case managers to learn on their own or when they had downtime during the day. Once we were able to identify what these challenges were, we were able to set objectives to address these challenges and plan a new way forward. So the first thing we did was we decided we needed to reduce this training time and reduce it by 50%. Because if we can cut training down six to eight months, that means we're getting six to eight months back in productivity among the new case manager. We also need to improve our standardization and accuracy. And so we identified an 85% new floor for case management accuracy. We also should adjust the training to account for varying learning styles like auditory, visual, and kinesthetic learners. For example, I'm a kinesthetic learner and I really need an opportunity to get my hands dirty and practice with the material. I can't just hear how it's done and then fully understand. We also needed to take control of our training and no longer rely on these external factors. We decide when each case is taught and we can't be sitting around waiting for these rare specific cases to come in. You know, after all, some of these case types only show up a few times a year. We also needed to designate one trainer to teach every new case manager the same way and to provide the trainee with resources to learn on their own during their downtime. Now, Jarrett is going to talk to us about our results. Thanks, and we're really pleased to let you know that after 18 months of developing, changing, piloting, uh, until we got a product that we were comfortable and really pleased with, um, our initiative actually met or exceeded our planned objectives. So first, we reduced the time it took for a new case manager to handle a full workload from an almost 14-month average to a predictable four-month average, or about a 75% reduction in training time. Next, our baseline accuracy from when we started the training program to after the first case managers went through the program increased by about 14% and up to a 96% accuracy level, which vastly exceeded our goal of 85%. I'll note that we did not start tracking how uh, we were determining our accuracy when we initially started the testing of this. So this number that we started with about 84.3 is probably higher than what the accuracy rating was before we even got into this. And then third, we use the National Center for State Courts core tools uh, employee satisfaction survey every six months in our office. And we ran the survey before we started the new program and then after which showed over a 12% increase in training satisfaction. And while our internal results were enough validation of the value and benefit of our program, we've also been honored to receive some national recognition as well. First, last year, our program was recognized with the federal government-wide E. Edwards Deming Outstanding Training Award in Human Capital Development. That picture on the screen is of several of us who at the awards ceremony, including our case managers who went through the program and others who helped develop it. 
The year before, we were also recognized with the Federal Judiciary's Director's Award for Excellence in Court Operations with a focus on mission requirements, which is based in part on this and other initiatives we implemented in our office to improve quality of service and have a aligned focus on accomplishing the mission of our clerk's office. With that in mind, I'll turn it back to Ken to explain and go through how this program works. So what exactly did we do for our training program? Well, we identified five important concepts to make this training as successful as possible. And I'm gonna take each of these concepts one by one. So let's start with foundational knowledge. So I think we can all agree that there is a very steep learning curve for case managers. They get hit with a lot of information all at the same time. And it is critical to teach this information in smaller, more digestible pieces. We have a two week orientation for all new hires um, in which we teach them about the court. Now, this is completely separate from our job specific training. They need to learn the basics about the court before they can before they can understand case management. Now, if you look here on the right, this is actually our clerk's office staff orientation. You will see that it's broken down by weeks with individual units. So we have unit one where they're learning about the court. We also have them learning about the clerk's office. And we really do schedule each and every one of these days on a specific topic that they learn about. It's also important to teach the why we process cases in the way we do. You know, this really helps with trainee retention of information. It is very, very difficult to rely on rote memorization when there are so many different types of cases and scenarios available. It's also, it's, it's critical to prepare resources for trainees before they start. You know, the trainer is going to get busy at times and trainees are going to have questions. They need to have a place where they can find answers to the questions that they have when they need it. So what we've also done is created a repository of procedures listing step-by-step -step instructions for processing all case types, and the trainees can access this information whenever they need it. So we decided to create a cumulative training model to ensure we can appropriately teach for all learning styles. And all of our training modules are based on these same principles. So first, you need to teach. This is our classroom and theory phase. This provides trainees with both written and verbal instructions, definitions, and information they need to be successful. This is extremely helpful for all of the auditory and visual learners out there. Then you allow them to practice in a simulated environment where they are encouraged to make mistakes. You know, we decided to leverage our train electronic case filing system, and we call it CMECF at the appellate level. But essentially what this train database does, it is a, it's an exact replica of the live database. So we can have our trainees go in and try real cases that we've had in the past and see how well they are at processing them. We actually have created a, a bank of 100 plus cases that we've had over the years that represent all different types of cases and, and ways of doing things so that they can practice using real cases. And the beauty of that then is that the trainer can go behind them and review how they process these cases and ensure that they are mastering the concepts. You know, for me, as a more of a kinesthetic learner, it's this practice in the train database that really, really helps. And I think it's a part that's missing in a lot of case management training across the country. So next, it's applying what they've learned now in the real environment, the real electronic case filing system. 
And then we have regular checks on their work and we provide regular feedback. This then moves us to our full quality control program where we continually take samplings of the cases that all of the case managers have done to identify a new team accuracy. We then use this information to adjust our training and see where our gaps and holes are. You know, this is, this is the same process that we used to collect all of the data that Jarrett was discussing in the earlier slide. So case management training is also broken into modules at our court. You know, this is helpful because it breaks the steep learning curve into smaller, more digestible pieces. It also allows us to stop and start portions of the training to meet the needs of the office. So for example, you know, we had an unexpected pandemic this year. Because we were broken into modules, we were able to quickly wrap up the module that the training was working on, pause the training, which then bought us time to figure out how to continue training in a virtual capacity. You know, without these definitive start and stops, training becomes confusing and it breaks the rhythm and it really does subtract from the learning process. So how we decided to break up our modules was based on case volume. So the high volume cases are taught first, lower volume cases are taught later on. If we get a case manager trained really, really well on one high volume case type, then in theory, they can process a full caseload. So I'm gonna give you an example from our court because at our appellate court, we get 30% of our cases from a single agency. So we made that our first module. We then can have that case manager handle most of those cases because, you know, if they can handle 30%, that's more than they're actually, they need to hold because we have five case managers. They really only need to process 20% of the cases. So then we subdivide the modules into units. So you'll see here we have unit one, unit two, and unit three. So unit one is case opening, unit two is motions, and unit three is briefs. So you see for all of the units, we have a prepare in trays, uh, train phase. And what we do there, that is the classroom component. So we do all of the teaching in these blue phases. And you'll see at the bottom in the key, this is the trainer and the trainee. Then we have the practice phase. So that's the simulated environment that I was discussing earlier. So the train ECF database. We also have the review and evaluate phases. So this is where the trainer goes in and reviews the work of the trainee and determines what their accuracy is. So this is kind of the assessment to see, are, is the trainee learning the concepts that they need to learn to be successful in this capacity? So you'll see at the bottom, it says you need an 85% minimum score to advance stages and units. So essentially this is our floor, this is our bottom. We expect our, case, our fully trained case managers to be up at the 90, 95% level. But for a new trainee, our floor is 85%. And once they have demonstrated through the random sampling of their cases in the train database that they can get 85% accuracy, we then graduate them from unit one and they can then focus more time and attention to unit two. But also why this is happening, you know what, these are running in, in parallel. So you'll see that there's a dotted line from train to prepare from unit one to unit two. So the kind of the beauty of this is we've structured our days into mornings and afternoons. And in the afternoons, we have our trainer doing the training for, for unit one. Okay, and then when they're done that training, they continue to do their afternoon sessions and get a classroom training for unit two. But now in the mornings, when they have time to work on their own, they can be doing these practice cases from unit one.
Okay, so I think the most important thing when you're dealing with training is that you, you really need to have a dedicated trainer. Uh, too often you will see offices that have a whole bunch of veteran case managers pulling the trainee every time they get a case to say, hey, hey, look over my shoulder. This is how this case is processed. You know, this really is not the most efficient or optimal way of doing training. And the reason is, is because it lacks standardization. Chances are your veteran case managers have slight differences and tweaks in how they are processing their, their cases. So now the trainee gets very, very confused and overwhelmed because they're being taught multiple different ways how to do the same process. So what we've done is we have, you know what, dedicated one person in our office who does all of the training. You know, what we also need are procedures because again, there are gonna be times where the, the trainer is gonna be working with someone else, they're gonna be checking emails, they're gonna be doing the other work that they have on their plate, and the trainee needs to find answers to their questions. So again, we created a repository of all the different processes, like step-by-step -step instructions for how to manage cases. And so if they have a question, they can go to this resource, we, we have ours on our, our SharePoint, and they can look up the answers to their questions. All right, and you can see in this in this picture here that this is our, our training room. So we have kind of dedicated space as well. So this room is used for other purposes, but we have a calendar and what we do is we schedule our training time in advance. So the whole clerk's office knows not to go into the training room while there's trainings in session. So you'll see on the left, we have our trainer she has her own computer that she's also projecting up to our Surface Hub so that the, the trainees who are on the right can observe how to process the various cases. So this is, again, kind of our classroom component. But we also have you know, computers in the training room that the trainees can use so that they can follow, on, follow along and do their training as well. You know, a key thing here is the constant communication between the trainer and the trainee. So essentially, if the trainee is making mistakes, the trainer can identify these mistakes early on, get them addressed so we can get them right on the on the right path. Um, before a major problem that we were facing is that trainees don't have regular feedback and they end up making the same mistake multiple times. And, you know, it becomes habit. And then, and habits are, are, are very difficult for them to break. Another kind of interesting obstacle that we had, and I, and I was touching on it earlier, was the pandemic. So we needed to kind of pause and figure out how we were going to do training in a, in a virtual capacity. So, of course, we had to train two new case managers during this entire pandemic process. We're actually wrapping up their, their training now but we've been able to kind of shift this to Microsoft Teams where we can kind of kind of recreate this environment virtually. So, you know, the trainer and the trainees can see each other, they can talk to each other, but we can also bring up screens in our electronic filing system for them to be able to follow along for the process. And then the trainees can also share their screens so that the trainer can follow along with what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong with processing these cases. I also meet with the trainees on a bi-weekly basis. And this is very, very important for me. And this is kind of my one-on-one -on -one opportunity with a trainee to discuss what is working and what is not. You know, some of these meetings take five minutes and the trainee says there aren't any issues, everything's going great, I'm enjoying my training, I'm learning lots, then we move on. But sometimes these meetings will take over an hour and the trainee will say, hey, I need a little bit more time on motions. I'm really struggling with motions. And that's perfect for me because then I can then interject and adjust the training as necessary. And because we can identify and get feedback early on, we can, you know, we might have to slow things down for a particular week on a particular topic, 
But then I'm also getting information that, hey, I'm really understanding case opening. I'm ready to move on early. And so we can keep the pace that we originally set out to keep. Now, this is my favorite slide because I come from a data and statistics background. So far too often, um, I see organizations implementing programs and never following up to see if the program is effective, if the program is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So what I think you oftentimes realize from collecting data is sometimes your programs aren't working and that's important information to have. So what we've been doing for this training program is we collected our baseline accuracy and then we reviewed our accuracy every month after. And during this 18 month process, we were able to see a steady, you know, improvement in our case management accuracy. And over the course of the time, we, we actually had a 14% improvement in accuracy. And that really kind of validates the program. We're not just doing it to do it. It actually works. Because let's be real, this takes a lot of time and resources to run a program like this, even just having a dedicated trainer. So again, you got to analyze the results. One thing that we found when we were analyzing our results was that we were struggling in briefs. Just across the board, we were struggling in briefs. So what we did was we needed to determine a new process for training briefs. The accuracy for case opening, for instance, was, was much higher than the accuracy for briefs. So we ended up dedicating more time and finding more briefs to use as examples in our train database. And again, this is all about comparing progress over time. You can also see yourself starting to plateau. So maybe we've gotten all the benefit that we can from the program as it stands. Now, you know, management has the opportunity to make a decision of, you know, whether to continue improving the program or if it's time to work on something else. And, and, and pivoting is, is crucial. I think so many times people are kind of afraid to collect data and analyze the data because they might find out something they didn't want to find out. But it's very important that you kind of change your culture around this idea. It's OK to find out that it's not working because we've identified it and now we have areas to improve and to move. At least we're not dedicating resources now for years on something that isn't effective. So, OK, this didn't work. Let's try something else. Then we'll collect data again. It might not work again. We'll pivot again and we'll just do this until we find something that is effective. All right, and Jared is going to talk to you about designing a program for your office. So how can you design a similar program for your office? Based on our 18 months of development and testing, uh, we have got our implementation of this system to about a six step process. Uh, we recommend these be done in order, but you could also do them in parallel with each other with some overlap, which as you can see is a style we like to use. Uh, it does add uh, some efficiencies in and reduce your, your time. So first, you want to analyze your case type volume and your staff work measurements. So it's a two part. So, Ken talked about, we have one area of our cases, there are 30% of those cases reflect all of the cases that we get, uh, but an individual case manager isn't expected to handle 30% of the cases. So we were looking for something that would be able to equal the amount of work that a single case manager would have to perform and could reasonably be expected to perform as a new employee. Again, we came up with this one area of cases that were not uh, the most complex that we had, but would give enough work that we could teach to a single case type. That may not be something that you have in your court. You may need to find uh, different combinations of cases that are on the less complex area, but that will get you enough a percentage of cases that uh, can equal the amount of work that a single case manager is reasonably expected to perform. The second part of that 
is you want to look at the amount of work distribution that you have for your case manager. So what is a reasonable amount of work that a new case manager or the, all of your case managers should be expected to, uh, to be able to perform? We like to have an equal distribution across our case managers, regardless of their experience. The complexity comes with the types of cases that they're handling, but that you may not wanna do that. You may wanna have more experienced cases, handle some more, newer case managers handle a little less. It's really whatever you're comfortable with doing. You also, as part of this next part of this, is you wanna look and see what different resources and staffing you have throughout your organization. One thing we looked at when, and when studying our case management process is the last 30% uh, time that a case uh, has uh, in our court does not require as much active case management as the first 70% of it does. We thought if we just took that 30% out uh, from the case manager's responsibility and assign it to another single person with uh, some additional duties, that would be enough to fill a full person's position as well as uh, increase the number of cases that individual case managers could handle. Um, so it actually allowed us to increase the, the case volumes for case managers while carving out different uh, positions for other people to help with some specialization for on more complex matters. Uh, as part of that, you also want to see what other functions and whatnot can be adjusted or shifted around so that you can ensure that when you do have a need for training, that someone is able to carve out uh, enough of their time to focus on providing that training and the quality of assurance for new uh, case managers while, during the period they're going through training. Next, uh, you want to identify what your modules and unit topics are going to be. So our modules are based entirely on case types. Uh, we think that's a good way to do it. You may have a different thought on, on how that could be, but again, it needs to work for your organization. The number of modules you have, it's as many as you think you need. Um, and similar with the units, we do ours by our three major document types, uh, case opening documents, briefs, and motions. You may have fewer, you may have more. It, it really doesn't matter, but thinking about what are the either natural breaks in the life cycle of a case, what are natural divisions of it so that you could teach fully that topic, have a clear start and stop so that as some of the examples Ken gave, you can pause and pivot if needed uh, because of circumstances. Next, you want to go through, once you know what you subjects you need to be teaching, you wanna go and create the different training samples um, in a test beta database if that's something that you have the ability to use. If not, you can create these in paper documents, you can create them as just PDF documents. It doesn't really matter, the technology shouldn't get in the way of what of having this uh, exist. But we have a bank of over 100 different um, cases and documents and samples that let us teach and show the range of materials that a case manager needs to know and will encounter uh, throughout uh, the time of working on these cases. But we don't have to wait for these items to just happen to show up um, in a real case to teach, teach to it. Uh, when we were creating these, uh, we got input from all of our case managers and, you know, we would say, oh, we need um, a document that covers this particular thing or we need this particular like type of motion. Um, the next time you see one, send it in, we'll review it. Or if you remember one from a past case. So we actually use uh, materials from past cases uh, that are real cases. We didn't have to make up anything. Um, and we think that's probably more realistic than having to create uh, something complete from scratch. And it's certainly uh, much easier to do. And then after you know all the different areas, you wanna make sure you've got a clearly written step-by-step uh, -step process on how to manage and process these materials. Uh, one, it's a teaching tool. Two, it's a supplemental aid for existing staff um, and is a great reference for people after they finish the training and helps facilitate the um, self-learning portion of the training. The part of the procedures, when you're going through them, you may have older procedures that need to be updated, which is always good to do. It also can give you an opportunity to go through and, hey, is this, do we need to do this procedure anyway? So it's a built-in way to also help just generally look at your case management uh, processes at the part time you're coming up with new training. And then last, uh, once you know what you're going to be training, you can go through and kind of ask yourself, what does success look like for, for example, processing emotion? How do I know a case manager is going to be successful uh, in uh, reviewing and docketing and preparing this, this item when it comes in? 
whatever those items are, uh, we call them kind of the critical critical points you have to get. Um, that's what you should be teaching to. So if you go through and say there are 10 critical things that uh, we expect the case manager to be able to do and to be able to do uh, accurately uh, when they're processing this type of item, those are the 10 things you want to emphasize in your training. There are also, you then have a, a good list of both what you're training, what the person knows what they're going to be evaluated on, and then you also have a built-in list of here are all the quality control items that uh, one person is working in live, that another staff person could then go through a checklist and see here are the things that I'm looking for to make sure. With what, what we do here, we're fully transparent with what these items are. So they're, here are the 10 things that we're gonna teach you. Here are the 10 things you're gonna be evaluated on. Here are the 10 things gonna go into coming up with your quality um, assurance review and for your accuracy review. So uh, we do recommend that be as uh, transparent as possible uh, so that people, you know, one, focus their attention where they need to be. And also, you know, the general spirit of transparency um, is a, a very good uh, management tool to, to use. And so uh, our contact information is up uh, on the screen for you. Uh, if you've not yet posed a question for us in the chat function, you can do so now and we'll respond to that. Uh, but uh, if you don't have a question for us now or come up with something later, uh, please feel free to reach out to us to discuss more about our program. We're also available to offer advice, consultation and recommendations about uh, how our program might work for your particular court. Ken, is there anything else? Um, I just wanted to to thank everyone for for watching our video. Um, and I just I'd highly encourage us taking advantage of the comments at the bottom. It's one thing for us to just sit here and teach these concepts. It's another to hear about the situation that you have at your office. And we would love to provide some feedback or hear some stories about case management training where you work. So that's all I have. and and thank you all for listening. Wonderful. And so with what I can only assume is a virtual standing ovation, I want to thank you again for all taking the time out of your very busy schedules, particularly during these difficult times, uh, to listen to us today. And we look forward to talking with you soon.